It's, it's certainly a pleasure to be here, uh, a great place for a conference. I brought my wife a little warmer than the last time we came, but uh, still beautiful. And exciting to me to be at an information technology in France. Uh, I remember very well in the 1970s the Minitel system that really was a forerunner of the internet. And the information technology industry has been forward-looking and pioneering ever since. And I'd like to talk to you about information technology, but from a broader perspective, going beyond what's happening now, what, hap what will happen next year, and really looking at how information is fundamental to our brains, our thinking, our intelligence, our bodies, our health, uh, matter and energy, objects are, are made of information, uh, and we're going to learn how to manipulate that using information technology. Ultimately, it will transform everything we care about. And it progresses in a unique way that is not intuitive. When, when I was a student, uh, I went to a college in the Boston area, MIT. I went there because MIT was so advanced in the 1960s that it actually had a computer. Most colleges didn't have one. And this computer that I carry around, there's nothing special about this, is a million times less expensive than the computer I use as a student. It's a thousand times more powerful. That's a billion times as much price performance as the computer I, I use as a student. A billion times more instructions per second, per dollar or per euro, a billion times more bits of memory per euro, a billion times more bits of communication, and we'll do it again in the next 25 years. 25 years from now, this will be the size of a blood cell. It'll be a billion times more powerful per unit, per unit currency again. And it turns out that progression is very predictable, and it underlies all of these different aspects of information technology. So while we can look at the implications of this on small time frames and the advent of cloud computing or social networking or wikis or blogs, if we, if we open up our perspective and look very broadly, we see, first of all, how predictable this progression is and how revolutionary it is. Now, I got into this because I decided I would be an inventor when I was five years old. Not really sure why that was the case, but my parents gave me all these enrichment toys, little objects that I could put together in a certain way. And I felt if I put them together in just the right way, I could create magical effects, transcendent effects. I didn't have that vocabulary. Uh, but I remember the feeling very well, and I discovered the computer at age 12. But it was about 30 years ago that I realized the key to being successful is timing. I mean, you all know that you have to do your projects at just the right time. Larry Page and Sergey Brin had a very good idea about reverse engineering the links on the Internet to create a better search engine. They did it at exactly the right time. And we do some early stage investing now, some mentoring of young companies. I would say all of those teams will actually complete the projects that they undertake. Most uh, inventors get their gadgets and software to work. And most of those projects will fail because the timing is wrong. Uh, they're not quite in the right place at the right time. You have to really be exactly in the right place. You've got to kind of be first to develop your market, but not too early. It's very tricky. So around 1980, I began to be an ardent student of technology trends. And I, being an engineer, I gathered a lot of data. And I thought if I visualized the data in just the right way, and I squinted at it, maybe I could see some broad trends. I really didn't expect to find anything that was very predictable. I believed the common wisdom that you cannot predict the future. The future is unpredictable. Uh, and I made a very surprising discovery. If you look at these underlying fundamental properties of information technology, like the power of computers per euro per dollar, uh, instructions per second per euro, or bits of memory per euro, or bits of communication per euro, 
or the number of bits of, of data we're moving around wirelessly, or the number of bits we're moving around on the internet, or the density of magnetic storage, or the amount of data we're getting from the brain every year, or the spatial resolution of brain scanning, or the cost of sequencing a base pair of DNA, because biological technologies have now become an information technology, or the number of base pairs of DNA that we're sequencing, and I could list a hundred others, they follow very smooth, predictable trajectories, trends, uh, that go through thick and thin, through war and peace, through boom times and recessions. This progression of the power of computation per unit currency has been a smooth, doubly exponential trend going back to the 1890 American census. And I'll show you that graph. That was the first one I did. And nothing affected it, not World War I, not World War II, not the Great Depression in the United States and Europe. It just continued no matter what was happening. And it affects not just these gadgets we carry around. It ultimately will affect everything we care about. Because industries start out not being an information technology. Our industry of information technology does not affect them. But then they undergo a transformation where they become information technologies. And one example of that is health and medicine and biology. That was not an information technology up until very recently. We would just discover things accidentally. Oh, here's something that lowers blood pressure. We don't really know why it works. There was no uh, theory of operation. There was no way of designing drugs or interventions to perform a purpose. That's why drugs on the market today have lots of side effects. We would systematically look for compounds that would improve sugar levels or lower heart attack risk or lower blood pressure. But because they weren't really designed to do a precise job, they had lots of side effects, and it was not an information technology. Health and medicine was just kind of an organized collection of accidentally found discoveries. It was useful. Life expectancy was 23 a thousand years ago. It was 37 in 1800. It was 48 in 1900. It's about 78 today. So we've made progress, but now it has become an information technology. Now we have the software that life and biology is based on, and we're also gaining the means of changing that software. I mean, how long do you go without updating the software on your cell phone? It's probably updating itself right now as we sit here. Uh, but I'm walking around with outdated software that evolved thousands of years ago that's really not in keeping with the times. For example, one gene called the fat insulin receptor gene says, hold on to every calorie, because the next hunting season may not work out so well. And that was a good idea, because you worked all day a thousand years ago to get a few calories. There were no refrigerators, so you store them in the fat cells of your body. So the fat cells hold on to every calorie. Now that underlies an epidemic of obesity, in my country, I don't see that so much here in France, uh, but a lot of people would like to turn off that gene. Uh, I'd like to tell my fat insulin receptor gene, you don't need to hold on to every calorie. I'm confident the next hunting season will be good. And that was actually tried in uh, animal experiments. They turned off this gene. These animals ate a lot. They remained slim. Uh, I know people in my country are very interested in this. Uh, Somehow, the French uh, people eat a wonderful cuisine and remain slim anyway, so... Um, but that's just one of the 23,000 genes we'd like to consider modifying. There are genes that promote cancer and heart disease. We'd like to turn those off. There are other genes we could add that would protect us from these diseases or turn off aging processes, and we have new means of actually changing our genetic code, not just in a baby, but in a mature individual. RNA interference, if you have a gene that you want to turn off, can turn that gene off in selected tissues in the body. New forms of gene therapy can add new genes. There's a whole field of stem cell therapies now where I can take a stem cell, not an embryonic stem cell, but actually take my skin cells, add four genes, create a pluripotent cell that can become, it's just like an embryonic stem cell, but it's not an embryonic stem cell. So the people who were concerned about 
ethical implications of embryonic stem cells support this research because there's no embryos involved. And anyway, if you want to grow a new liver or new heart cells, you'd like to do it with your DNA, not the DNA of some other fetus. Uh, and there are now projects all over the world to regrow livers, or you can actually get your heart rejuvenated if you've had it damaged in a heart attack that was never feasible before. And every organ in the body, including our skin, uh, are being rejuvenated with, with stem cells. So this is, these are new technologies that are basically information technologies because they're reprogramming the information underlying biology. The significant thing about it is when health and medicine was just hit or miss, it was not an information technology. It did not grow exponentially. It, it, it grew linearly. Now that it's an information technology, it's going to grow exponentially. Doubling in power every year, these technologies will be a thousand times more powerful in 10 years. And there's a, I'd like to show you a few examples, a few dozen examples of just how predictable and pervasive and multifarious these different examples of information technology are. Uh, but it's important to contemplate the difference between linear growth, which is what our intuition tells us. When we think things through intu intuitively, and this is the, the source of many debates I've gotten in with other scientists, they're thinking of the current pace of progress, they assume that's just going to continue. That's actually intuitive in our brains. That's hardwired in our brains. When we walked through the fields a thousand years ago and we saw an animal coming at us, we made a linear prediction where that animal would be, and that worked pretty well, and that became hardwired in our brains. The reality of information technology is exponential, not linear. So what difference does that make? Well, if I take 30 steps linearly, that's our intuition about the future. One, two, three, four, five, I get to 30. And that's why many predictions of the future uh, are very limited in their perspective. Uh, if you take 30 steps exponentially, and that's the reality of information technology, it goes 2, 4, 8, 16, you get to a billion. It makes a huge difference. Uh, when the Genome Project was announced in 1990, mainstream uh, scientists were skeptical and said, you're never going to finish this in 15 years. In 1989, we only finished one ten thousandth of the genome. Halfway through the project, the skeptics were going strong, saying, I told you this wasn't going to work. Here you are halfway through the project, seven and a half years into a 15-year project, and you finished 1% of the project. This is a failure. My response was, no, that's, we're right on schedule. We're almost done. 1% uh, is only seven doublings from 100%, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, and so on. And indeed, it continued to double every year. It was finished seven years later. Uh, right around the time that Minitel was still going strong, uh, there was something called the ARPANET, uh, inspired by Minitel in the United States, sponsored by the American Defense Department. It tied together a few thousand scientists. Uh, but it was doubling every year, and I projected this out and said there'll be a World Wide Web emerging, connecting hundreds of millions of people to each other and to vast knowledge resources emerging in the late 1990s. People thought that was crazy. Uh, but that is, in fact, what happened. That's the power of exponential growth. And ultimately, it's going to transform everything we care about. And as, I mean, you've been following information technology very closely, and as dramatic as it's been, it's going to continue growing exponentially, and it's going to continue to affect more and more facets of life. And I'd like to show you actually how it's a good thing, because there's a very common perception that technology is in fact, making things worse, but I want to show you how it is actually increasing wealth of nations, health of nations, education, and other social factors. So, one of the implications is technology is getting smaller. I mean, this is a hundred thousand times smaller than the computer I used uh, as a student, despite being a thousand times more powerful. And ultimately, it'll be so small, it'll go inside our bodies and brains. And let me show you this, a few examples of, of this exponential growth. 
So this is a, an, what we call a logarithmic scale, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. So as we go up the scale, we're not adding to something. We're multiplying by powers of 10. So every level on this graph is 1,000 times greater than the level below it. So this is a graph of the number of bits we're moving around wirelessly. So 100 years ago, we were actually transmitting bits of information wirelessly. It was Morse code over AM radio. Today we have 4G networks. And look at how smooth a progression this is. And this is not some you know, United Nations mandated policy. This is not uh, controlled by the telecommunications industry. Uh, this is not a physical law. This is just what happened from all of the competition, all the millions of people involved in this technology, and you get this very predictable progression. A straight line on a logarithmic scale is exponential growth. And because every level is a thousand times greater than the level below it, this sort of squashes the amount of progress. This represents trillions fold increase in the number of bits we're moving around, and there's no end in sights uh, as, we, as we move to terahertz frequencies and so on. So this is the graph I had in 1980. Well, I only had it sort of up to here. So this is not something I did last week, and now I'm sort of overfitting to, to old data. Uh, I had this through 1980. I progress. I projected out where the curve w should go, would go. Indeed, it's followed that graph very precisely. So I've been making forward-looking predictions for 30 years. Again, every level on this graph is 100,000 times greater than the level below it. So again, this represents trillions-fold increase in the power of computers as measured in instructions per second per dollar, uh, constant dollar, constant currency, uh, since the 1890 American census. And again, notice how smooth a progression this is. I mean, a lot happened in the 20th century. We had World War I, World War II, the Cold War, the Great Depression. I mean, all kinds of things happened. None of that had any effect on this. The recent recession had no effect on it. And one of the criticisms of this is, well, Kurzweil takes these exponentials and projects them out, and we all know exponential growth can't go on forever. If you have two rabbits in Australia, you get four rabbits, eight rabbits, 16 rabbits, but finally that comes to an end when the rabbits eat up all the foliage, all the vegetables, and it doesn't continue anymore. Shouldn't that be the case here also? And the answer is yes, for specific methods, specific paradigms that bring exponential growth to computing or to any other area in information technology, it runs out of steam. But it leads to research pressure to create the next paradigm, and the next paradigm is there in time. For example, here, in 1952, the American network CBS predicted the election of Eisenhower, the first time the American networks did that, and they did that with a vacuum tube-based computer. And then every year they were taking the vacuum tubes, making them smaller and smaller. I have a little museum, and we have a computer with tiny little vacuum tubes. Finally, they got to the point where they couldn't shrink the vacuum tubes anymore and keep the vacuum, and that was the end of the shrinking of vacuum tubes. It was not the end of the exponential growth of computing. It just went to a whole other approach to transistors and finally to integrated circuits. People say, oh, this is Moore's law. Moore's law just kicked in around here, uh, has to do with chips, uh, making the component sizes smaller so we could put twice as many components every two years on a chip. Uh, this progression started decades before Gordon Moore was even born. And then people say, oh, well, Moore's law is going to come to an end. And uh, Gordon Moore, in fact, himself said it would end in 2002. Intel now says 2022. But Intel will also tell you, if you speak to their chief technology officer, Justin Ratner, that they have the sixth paradigm working in their labs, which is to go beyond two-dimensional chips and organize circuits as self-organizing molecular circuits uh, that will compute at the scale of molecules, and that will keep this going well into the 21st century, and there'll be paradigms after that. So I don't want to dwell on these examples of electronics. I mean, look at this graph here. Again, very smooth exponential progress. You could buy one transistor for a dollar. 
Uh, I think a euro is about the same thing in 1968. Now you can buy a billion of them for a dollar. And again, look at how predictable that is. Uh, as we make them uh, cheaper, they're better because they're smaller. The electrons have less distance to travel. So we've had an exponential growth in the speed. The cost of a transistor cycle, one cycle of a transistor, the cost has come down by half every year. That's a 50% deflation rate. Now, if you talk to economists, they're just as afraid of deflation as they are inflation, and they're afraid of this deflation uh, because if you can get the same stuff, the same instructions per second, the same bits of memory, the same bits of communication, the same base pairs of DNA sequencing, the same data about the brain, a year later for half the cost, are you going to buy more? Yes, you'll buy more, but are you actually going to double your consumption? Uh, you're not going to be able to double your consumption year after year to keep up with this progression. As information technology encompasses more and more things, ultimately it will encompass physical things because there's a whole technology of three-dimensional printing emerging where we can take an information file and create a, a physical object, and I'll show you examples of that in a moment, and the scale of precision is getting finer and finer every year. We're ultimately talking about physical things, and if you get twice as much physical things and DNA data and so on each year for the same cost, you're going to increase your consumption but not double it, and therefore the size of the economy as measured in currency will shrink. And actually, that's not what we find. We actually more than double our consumption. There's been 18% growth in every form of information technology. That's your industry. Uh, despite the fact that you can get twice as much of it each year for the same cost, 18% per year for the last 50 years. And the reason for that, as price performance reaches certain levels, whole new applications explode on the landscape. Here's bits of memory shipped. This is more than 100% growth. It's uh, about 216% per year. Uh, so uh, you get uh, about 18% growth per year in currency after you take out the 50% deflation rate. But it's true of every form of information technology. This is what's actually responsible for economic growth. It's the non-information technology industries that are shrinking. Well, magnetic data storage, I just put this up because it's not Moore's Law. It's just different scientists, different engineers, uh, different companies, different people, same progression. It's a basic uh, rule. I, I call it the law of accelerating returns, having to do with information technology. Biotechnology, I mentioned that earlier. This is a major revolution. Uh, we're going to be able to create interventions and drugs that are much more precise, that don't have all the harsh side effects of prescription drugs and other interventions today. Because those were accidentally found. Uh, they're not really designed for a particular task. Invariably, they have many side effects. Uh, there's many different ways to measure this, and we could spend the whole hour on this. But I mean, this is a logarithmic scale. That slope is a doubling every year, the total amount of genetic data. We're collecting. There are other projects like this, the Proteum Project, how the genome expresses itself in proteins, how proteins interact with each other using three-dimensional physical modeling and so on. The cost of sequencing a base pair DNA has come down by half every year. Communications, uh, well, this actually starts way after Minitel, but uh, this slope is a doubling every year than the amount of data we're moving on the internet. I showed you earlier exponential growth of, of wireless data. This is actually very democratizing. I wrote in the 1980s that the then emerging social network, which was early forms of email over teletype machines and phone lines, fax machines, uh, would sweep away the Soviet Union. So these basically information technology hackers who kept everybody in the know uh, destroyed the monopoly of inf control over information that the authorities had had traditionally, and that this would sweep away the Soviet Union. And people thought that was ridiculous. I and mean, the Soviet Union was a mighty superpower. It was built to last. 
The fact that a few teletype machines is going to sweep this away seemed absurd, but that's exactly what happened. And then with the rise of the web in the late 1990s, uh, we saw a whole wave of democratization during the world. We're seeing uh, more uh, democratization with the rise of social networks. I mean, look at a map, a political map, from shortly after World War II, you'll see how few democracies there were. As information technology has gotten more pervasive, uh, so has democratization of nations. It also affects communication at other levels of society. If a woman has a chronic disease and she goes to her doctor's office, she's in touch with everybody around the world who has that condition. They are sharing information about research and ideas about how to manage it. Uh, she may very well know more than her doctor does, and that changes the relationship. It democratizes it. So this is the graph I had in the 1980s. I had actually just a few points, and I projected it out and projected a World Wide Web emerging in the mid to late 1990s. This graph is the same data as this one, but seen on a linear scale, not a logarithmic one. And this is the world we live in. We don't live in a logarithmic domain. So to the casual observer, it looked like the World Wide Web came out of nowhere. But you could see it coming if you looked at the exponential proje proje uh, projection. With shrinking technology, as I mentioned, this is a picture that was on the cover of The Economist a few weeks ago. It's an actual violin that was printed out on a three-dimensional printer. So if I want to send you a movie, a sound recording, a book, maybe two years ago I would have to send you a package. Uh, today I can send you an email attachment and create those objects. Uh, I, can, in fact, can send you a violin as an email attachment if you have one of these three-dimensional printers. Ultimately, there will be... Ver Today, they're expensive, and the, the scale of resolution is in microns, which is pretty fine, but not really fine enough to, to create anything. Uh, but that scale is, is also progressing exponentially at a rate of 100 in 3D volume per decade. So in about 20 years, this will be nanotechnology. We'll be able, I'll be able to send you an email attachment, and you'll be able to print out a blouse or a solar panel or a module to, to build inexpensive, high-quality housing. Uh, and I'm involved with a project to do exactly that. This is an actual violin that plays. And so information is becoming physical objects, and that's going to increase in precision and quantity and price performance uh, also in the years ahead. And all of this is progressing at an exponential pace. And we will also apply this to biology. Uh, this is a video of a design of a three-dimensional uh, nanobot, which is the size of a blood cell. This, this particular design actually replaces your red blood cells, and it's about a thousand times more powerful than your red blood cells. So if you, did a, if you replaced a portion of your biological red blood cells with this, you could actually do an Olympic sprint for 15 minutes without taking a breath, or sit at the bottom of your pool for four hours. And ESPN, the American Sports Network, interviewed me and said, we're going to ban these, right? And, I said, I'm not so sure. We should ban steroids, because steroids are bad for your health, and if you don't ban them, you're forcing athletes to do something that's bad for their long-term health to boost their short-term physical performance. Uh, these are actually good for your health. They would prevent a heart attack, for example. Uh, most exciting would be a device that actually augments your white blood cells, uh, which are your immune system. Uh, if we didn't have white blood cells, we wouldn't last very long, but they're very imperfect. They don't recognize cancer, for example. It thinks cancer is you, so it doesn't attack cancer. Uh, sometimes it will attack you. Those are autoimmune disorders. We could have these non-biological devices, which are much faster, more intelligent. They can download new software from the Internet uh, to combat new pathogens that emerge and so on. Uh, recently, there was a cover story in Time Magazine on my ideas, and they said, well, we want, here's a computer we just covered a few weeks ago, and we want you to put that one on, on the graph. See if it really falls on the curve. Maybe it'll be above or below, but it's actually the, the last curve there, and it's right on the curve. Uh, it, it really is remarkable to me. I mean, even though it's my theory, I'm surprised every time 
we put a new computer on, it's always on that curve. And it's amazing how predictable this is, because this is not the decision of some government or United Nations or Industry Council. This is just what happened from the competition of many people. And it's, it really is surprising how uh, predictable it is. But there's a reason for it. We always use the latest technology to create the next. And I gave a speech a few days ago for a leading network company, Juno Per Networks. And uh, so th they said every year they have to design the network to be twice as capable for the same cost. Now, how is it that they can do that? They're not, they're not suddenly twice as smart. But every single thing they use, the computers they use to design these things, the components they have to use, are all getting more and more powerful. So they're constantly building on technology which is twice as powerful, and so they create their technology to be twice as powerful. And inherently, if you're dealing with information technology, it grows in this exponential manner, and remarkably predictably. So right now, I'm actually working on my next book, which is about the brain. It's called How the Mind Works and How to Build One. I, I refer to it as the mind rather than the brain, because the mind is a brain that's conscious and has free will and has identity. And those are actually philosophical issues, and we could also talk the full hour about those. Uh, but it's my view, and I've been consistent on this, by 2029 we will have computers that are completely not biological, that will be able to be as convincing and as subtle as human intelligence will pass the so-called Turing test, uh, which is a language-based test where it could be convincing that it's a human, uh, but in my view it's not uh, some invasion of intelligent machines from Mars to compete with us. Uh, we, we're creating these tools to make ourselves smarter. I'm already smarter because of these devices. I mean, this makes me smarter. I can, I mean, I do this all the time. I did it just last night to settle an argument over dinner. You can get you access to all, all the world's knowledge with a few keystrokes. And in the groups that I manage, I can have three people working for three weeks do what used to take 100 people a year. Uh, there's no question all of us are smarter, more productive, and capable because of these brain extenders. And that's, in fact, why we create these tools. We're the only species that does that. Ever since we p picked up a stick to reach a higher branch, we've extended our reach with our tools, first physically and now mentally. And these devices are going to get smaller, smarter and smarter. And what's going to drive that is more and more insight as to how the best example we have of human intelligence works, which is the human brain itself. And it's not hidden from us. And we are making exponential gains in understanding the brain, simulating it. And uh, there's actually a lot we know already. The most important region is called the cortex. Uh, it's actually a very uniform region, and it's where we do our thinking. And so I can take a whole bunch of ideas, and each of them have a symbol, and I can organize them in a certain way in my mind, and I can call that an idea and give it a name, a symbol. And then I can use that word or symbol with other symbols and create another idea and give that a name, and then use that with other ideas and create another idea. This whole hierarchy of ideas we call knowledge, and it's the neocortex that allows us to do that. And that takes place in the cortex. It's a flat region. It's crumpled up on top of the brain. It's about the size of a table napkin. And that actually is, was one of the key enabling factors allowing us to create technology, because only mammals have a neocortex, and in other mammals it's much smaller. In primates, it's a good deal smaller, like in a chimpanzee, it's about the size of a number 10 envelope. And so that enabled us to conceptualize uh, things like tools and technology. And then we have a posable appendage, a thumb, that allows us to have an idea. Oh, I could take that stick, and I could strip the leaves off, and I could put a point on it. And then I had a, a thumb that actually enabled me to do that. And what's interesting about the neocortex is it's very uniform. For example, I, I have l there's about a billion little modules in it that recognize a pattern. And they're all pretty much the same. So I'll have some that recognize, for example, a capital A. 
or actually they'll just recognize the crossbar in a capital A. And so I've got these little recognizers and they fire and they say, ah, crossbar of a capital A. And they then send that signal up to a higher level. And at that higher level, it's getting other signals and it says, aha, capital A. And it sends a signal up. And then at the next higher level, it's got recognizers that recognize A and P and P and it goes, aha, the word Apple. And it sends a signal up. It's organized in a big hierarchy. And we're learning the secrets of this. At the very highest level, we have recognizers that go, oh, that was funny, or that was ironic, or gee, that was sad. You probably think that those are very complex compared to the, to the simple ones at the bottom that recognize something like the crossbar and a capital A, but they're actually the same. Uh, they just exist at different levels in this conceptual hierarchy. Uh, there was actually an uh, interesting experiment where they were doing open brain surgery on a young girl, and she was conscious. You can be conscious during brain surgery because there are no pain receptors in the brain. And whenever they stimulated a particular point, she would, la she would start laughing. And they thought they had triggered some involuntary laugh reflex because whenever they triggered this point, she would just burst out laughing. But they were actually triggering the perception of humor. She found everything very funny whenever they triggered this particular point. And we have more than one point where we find things funny. Uh, and we're learning how this works. We don't have a full command of it, but this is progressing at an exponential rate. And then we have an understanding of the visual cortex, the auditory cortex. The cerebellum is another important region. Uh, that's where we do our skill formation, like catching a fly ball. The fact that you can learn that skill or your signature, that's all done by the cerebellum, physical skills. That has 10 billion modules that are repeated over and over again. And we do actually have a very good simulation of the cerebellum that can learn skills similar to a human. And this is something that other animals have, because animals are very good at physical skills in the wild. So let's look at how this, all of this progression in these technologies, particularly information technology, has affected the welfare of the human species. And of course, a lot of people are pessimistic uh, and think things are getting worse. I would say at least one of the reasons for that is we have better information about what's wrong. If there's a battle 1,000 miles away or 10,000 miles away, it's right at our fingertips. We see it. We're, it's as if we're there. That was not true 50 year or 100 years ago. We hardly were aware of what was going on in the world. We have much better information about the problems. That's painful, but it's actually a good thing because if we see problems, we tend to do something about them. But this is actually an interesting uh, illustration. So this is the year 1800. Each of these circles is a different country. The big red circle is China. And that circle down there is, is the United States. And this is income per person, actually, on a logarithmic scale. So, and it's in today's US dollars. So generally, income per person was in the hundreds of dollars of today's dollars. And life expectancy, this is a linear scale. It was in the 20s and 30s. Uh, nobody got much above 40. And this was the state of the world in 1800. And there's a divide between the, be the more advanced nations at that time and the less advanced nations. So there's a, there is a have-have-not divide. And as you watch this, you'll see that that divide continues to take place. But watch what happens to the whole group of, of uh, countries. So not much happens at first. This is the early Industrial Revolution. Uh, you can see some countries are starting to, to make some progress. But as we get into the 20th century, you see almost a wind that moves these circles up to the upper right-hand corner. So now we're getting past World War II. And it, you can see the general direction of progress. And it will stop in 2009, but it's, 
but the actual progress is not st stopping. And the poorest nations in the world are in Africa, but they're much better off than the most advanced countries were at the beginning of this process. Uh, and this is going to continue to move in that direction. Uh, economic growth in general has been progressing exponentially. It's driven by this, which is the value of a, an hour of human labor has grown from $30 to $130 in constant dollars over the last 45 years uh, through the power of information technology. And that's despite the fact that you can get a lot more for a dollar, at least when it comes to information technology. I mean, how much would a million dollars of computer uh, computation and memory uh, circa 1990 cost today? One dollar. And despite that, it's still considered to be worth only a dollar, even though if I have a dollar of computation today, it's worth a million dollars. 20 years ago, we still counted as only one dollar. And despite that, uh, we've had this exponential progress in the value of human labor, amplified by our technology. Information technology is growing as a share of the economy. It will be most of the economy by the 2020s, so you're in the right field. Uh, there's a lot of controversy ever since uh, the first Industrial Revolution 200 years ago that we're destroying jobs, and indeed we are destroying jobs at the bottom of the skill ladder. We're adding new jobs at the top of the skill ladder, and so the skill ladder is moving up. If I were a prescient futurist in 1900, I would say, and that's true here in France, it's true in the United States, that a third of you work on farms and a third of you work in factories. And I would say in 100 years, in the year 2000, that'll be 3% and 3%, and everybody would say, oh my God, we'll all be out of work. And I'd say, well, don't worry, you'll get jobs as information technology professionals or web designers, and nobody would have any idea what I'm talking about. Most of the jobs today didn't exist 50 years ago or 100 years ago, and they require a higher level of education. So we're investing actually 10 times as much per student in constant currency uh, over the last 100 years um, in K through 12. In the United States, we had 60,000 college students in 1870. We have 10 million today. So we are investing more in education. Here's a graph uh, over the last 50 years of the number of years of schooling we're providing our, our children. So in the developed countries, it's more than doubled. Uh, there's a gap between the developed countries and the developing countries, but they're moving up too, and that's even more than doubled uh, over the last 50 years. And I'll show you one more trend, uh, because these technologies are affecting not just the gadgets we're carrying around. They ultimately will affect things like energy. Uh, Larry Page and I were asked by the National Academy of Engineering in the United States to do a study of all the emerging energy technologies. And we noticed that nanotechnology, which is a form of information technology, is applying an understanding of the information processes of molecules and atoms to create new materials. And that's being applied to solar panels. So the cost per watt of solar energy is coming down. So this is the cost of one watt uh, in solar energy, and it's coming down quickly. And so the total amount of solar energy is on this curve. This is on a logarithmic scale. Look at the smooth exponential progression. It's actually been doubling every two years, uh, and has been for 25 years. So it's doubled 12 times, again, very smoothly. And it's only eight doublings away from meeting 100% of the world's energy needs. Uh, and so the National Academy of Engineering asked, uh, well, do we have enough sunlight to do this with? And I said, yes, we have 10,000 times more than we need. In other words, after we get done doubling eight more times and meeting all of the world's energy needs from solar energy, we'll be using one part in 10,000 of the sunlight that falls in the Earth. So it's not the case we're running out of energy. It's just in the wrong form. We can't plug our refrigerators today and air conditioners into the sun uh, unless you convert it to electricity, but that is progressing at an exponential rate. So let me sum up and then leave some time for questions. Uh, this is the progress we've made uh, before 
health and medicine was an information technology. And, you know, it was not in the interest a thousand years ago for people to live that long in terms of biological evolution. It was limited food, and so once you were 25, you're just using up the food of the tribe, and it's better that you not uh, carry on. And life expectancy was in the early 20s, a thousand years ago. You were done raising your kids. Uh, 37 in 1800, if you read Thomas Hobbes or Charles Dickens, you can see how difficult life was. Uh, it's not pushing 80, but this is going to go into high gear. Uh, now that health and medicine and biology has become an information technology, there are literally thousands of projects using computers to simulate biology and recreate these processes and move them away from disease and, uh, and other aging processes. Uh, I'm involved in a couple of very promising cancer projects where we're really learning how cancer works and learning some triggers, genetic triggers that can be switched to a different position to discourage or, or even eliminate cancer. And this, this is just one of many examples. So this is a very exciting industry. Uh, you certainly are aware that your work affects every other industry, uses information technology, but literally these industries are becoming information technologies. Uh, and the progress in that is going to grow at an exponential rate. That's not our intuition. And this is going to put into high gear, uh, in my view, the purpose of being human, which is to transcend, to go beyond our limitations. We didn't stay in the ground. We didn't stay in the planet. We have not stayed with the limitations of our biology. Uh, and with a mastery of the information processes in our lives, we will uh, continue this this progress to create better lives for everyone. This is a downside too, but maybe we'll get to that in the questions. Thank you very much. <laughs> so we have time for some questions. I think there's some... Uh, Suzanne? Uh, First of all, great presentation, Ray. You have so much information, you kind of glossed over nanobots. And nanobots, in reading your books and talking to you, are able to do such amazing things, like in 15 or so years, vaporize arterial plaque, <coughs> turn off islet cells for diabetes and cancer protective genetic switches being turned back on. But with the brain, there's an opposing force at work right now because of the chemicalization of the planet. And there's a lot of thinking that the chemicals not only create brain cancer, but the chemicals are going to dumb us down. Will your nanobots be able to smarten us up? Well, uh, yes, I think uh, we certainly have put many poisons in our environment. Those are of grave Concern. I would be even more worried about it if, if I felt there weren't positive trends uh, that I've talked about. In about 20 years or so, we'll be, begin to have these blood cell size devices. They'll start out by be keeping our bodies healthy. They will ultimately will go in our brains, interact with our biological neurons, uh, and make us smarter, put our brains on the Internet, extend our thinking with cloud computing, uh, right, I mentioned that our cortex has a billion pattern recognizers. That sounds like a big number, but it's actually fairly limited, and the fact that we can't remember more than we do and that we forget things uh, has to do with that limited number. Why not have a trillion uh, and have uh, them running out on the web? If it sounds very futuristic to put a computer and connect it into your brain and then download new software to that computer, people are doing it already, at least for things like Parkinson's disease. You can have a computer replace uh, much of the, uh, the functionality of those destroyed neurons uh, with this device, and you can actually download new software to it from outside the body. Uh, and this is, an F, uh, this is an approved therapy here in Europe and in the United States. Uh, right now, they're, they require surgery because it's not blood cell size, it's pea size. It's pretty small. But ultimately, we're going to be merging 
with this technology. I, and I think it's going to happen soon enough. Uh, we're talking two, three decades uh, that the assault we have in terms of our environment and so on will not be so catastrophic that we can't reverse that. If we live forever, how will we feed us? Well, first of all, I, I can never come to this conference and say, well, I've done it, I've lived forever, because uh, it's never forever. But what we can do, in my view, is overcome successively uh, the various tragedies that, that limit our lives. I think we're actually not far, uh, as in within a decade of overcoming many of the diseases we struggle with, like cancer and heart disease and so on. And, uh, I have a series of three health books. The last two have been with a co-author, Dr. Terry Grossman. And in there we talk about a bridge to a bridge to a bridge. So bridge one is what you can do right now. And this, that, that would also be a whole hour of discussion. Uh, how you can slow down aging processes much more than people realize and stay healthier longer. Uh, but that's a bridge to the full flowering, the biotechnology revolution where we can reprogram the information processes underlying our biology. That'll bring us to this nanotechnology revolution. For example, nanobots in the bloodstream that will augment your immune system to keep you healthy. And that'll bring us to a future point. Uh, so it's never a guarantee, but we will get to a point where we can successfully extend our lives. And yes, if we then stuck with the 19th century first industrial revolution technologies we use today to provide energy and water and food, uh, we would run out of those resources. We're only limited in resources uh, if we stick with uh, first industrial revolution technologies. Energy, I mentioned, we have 10,000 times more energy than we need coming from the sun. We'll be able to convert that. Uh, that is, in fact, growing already exponentially. Water, we have plenty of water. It just happens to be salty, salinated, or dirty. But if we have inexpensive energy, we know how to clean it up. Uh, we're going to apply new technologies to augment food production and make it uh, more productive, healthier, uh, be able to grow plants without pesticides, uh, ultimately very inexpensively. Uh, we're actually pretty close already to having uh, very substantial food production. There are political issues that prevent its distribution, but uh, we're going to continue to transform food production. Uh, so we're going to have plenty of resources made available by the same technologies. And then people say, okay, well, we'll have plenty of food and water and energy, but it's going to be boring to live hundreds of years. And I agree with that, too. It would be boring to have dramatic extensions to life expectancy without also having dramatic life expansion. And these technologies will make life more interesting. I mean, look at what information technology has done already. You have at your fingertips all of these movies and books and uh, not to mention blogs. If you want to read a billion blogs, are, they're out there. Uh, people can create communities based on common interest, and you know, you, you all know 12 year olds who have friends around the world who have, share their interests uh, because of these technologies. That's going to continue. We're going to make ourselves smarter, as we have already, uh, so we're not going to get bored. We're going to have radical life expansion along with the extension. Let me, went, let me mention one thing which I alluded to at the end of my speech, which is there is a downside as well. And they, you know, fire kept us warm and cooked our food, but also burned down our villages. And uh, ever since we've had technology, it has amplified 
human well-being, but also been used as a tool of destruction. And these new technologies are equally powerful. Uh, take biotechnology. I mean, we are close at hand to reprogramming biology away from cancer and so on. Uh, but the same technology, the same tools could be used by a bioterrorist to reprogram a biological virus to create a deadly bioterrorism weapon. And so some people have said, well, let's just not pursue these technologies because they're too dangerous. And very often they cite my own writings because I've written extensively about what those downsides are. Uh, and I agree with the downsides. I don't agree with that answer, that prescription. Uh, first of all, I think it would deprive us of these profound benefits. And there's still a lot of suffering in the world to go around that we need to address. And I think we have a moral imperative to do that. Secondly, it would require a totalitarian government to ban technology. Uh, there's a novel Brave New World that has exactly that theme. And thirdly, it wouldn't work. It would just drive these technologies underground where they'd be even more dangerous and even more out of control and where responsible scientists would be deprived of the tools to create defenses against abuse. And that actually is my prescription, to have ethical guidelines so responsible scientists follow certain ethics and laws to keep the technology safe. So in biotechnology, for example, there's been something called the Asilomar Guidelines, which came from a conference called the Asilomar Conference. How do you keep biotechnology safe? And, the, and that's actually worked pretty well. There's actually been no accidents for the last 25 years. Uh, but you also need a rapid response system to deal with someone who tries to be destructive, who are not going to follow the ethical guidelines. I've actually worked with the U.S. Army, which in the United States is the agency responsible for protecting the public from uh, bioterrorism. And I've worked on this issue with, with them to create a rapid response system that would detect a new virus and deactivate it very quickly. The same way we do, for example, with software viruses. If we just sat back and said no one would ever put out a destructive software virus, the Internet wouldn't last more than a few minutes. But we have actually a technological immune system that detects new viruses, helps reverse engineer them. Antidotes are created with human assistance spread virally out on the internet. And that actually has worked quite well. Nobody has taken down the internet for any appreciable amount of time over the last 20 years. Uh, and we need to do something similar for biological viruses and for all of these other dangers. So that's, again, a long discussion uh, it's not a pat answer. It's not simple. Uh, from a policy point of view, I think we have to give a high priority to keeping these technologies safe. Uh, but there is, there is a downside. Thank you very much. <laughs>